Hello, today we have Jay Chandan, Chairman and CEO of Gorilla Technology Group, trading on the NASDAQ under the ticker GRRR. Jay, welcome. Greg, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Gorilla achieved a remarkable 222% revenue growth in the first half of 2024. For investors unfamiliar with your journey, what key factors are driving this impressive growth? Greg, our, our revenue growth in H1 2024 uh, is a result of what we call meticulously focused strategy with three pillars. Right? Um, our organization is built upon revenue generation, market expansion, and transformative partnerships. Now, in terms of generating revenue, we're not just selling products. We're delivering integrated, indispensable solutions. Let me just walk you through how we get that done. For example, our Gorilla Intelligent Network Director product, for example, works on critical network security and operational optimization. But here's the kicker. It's not a one-time sale. Okay, this strategy is all about recurring revenues and growth. So it's not just the top line. If you look at our profits, we've gone up by almost 450 plus percent in H1 of 24, and we aim to keep that going forward into 25 and 26. Now, our market expansion strategy, which I talked about, which is our second pillar, is predominantly focused on the regions where we believe that investments are being made actively today to build smart cities. Southeast Asia, East Asia, Latin America, the United States, and Middle East, North Africa. Now, these countries um, are investing very heavily into what we call the global smart cities market, particularly in what we call AI-driven cybersecurity, AI-driven analytics. Now, we're not just scratching the surface, we're securing large-scale contracts and high-value projects which are transforming the business. And finally, it's the partnerships. Now, you've seen our partnerships with Lanner, NCDG in the United States. It's all game-changing for us, right? A small organization such as ours not only looks at these partnerships um, to build and scale, but we're looking at these as revenue multipliers. Going forward, we believe that each of these regions will help sustain growth, growing whether they're growing 9% or 30%. It allows us to go into you know, what we call penetrate and then secure lucrative contracts, which will take, you know, uh, will help materialize our revenues for the foreseeable future. Now, Jay, as you've made abundantly clear in that first answer, your market is evolving rapidly. Can you quantify the addressable market size Gorilla is pursuing and how much have you got so far? Uh, we've not even got a tip of it, right? It's like, it's like you know, the more we dig, uh, the deeper it gets, right? I mean, I mean, AI convergence, cybersecurity, the smart infrastructure always keeps expanding. It's expanding, the market option expanding on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about it this way, right? You're walking into an all-you-can-eat buffet where the dishes get kept, you know, keep getting better and more exciting. But trust me, we're not just grabbing the plate, we're helping cook the feast, right? So in terms of quantification, we're talking about AI cybersecurity, for example, and the market was valued at about 19 to $20 billion in 22, is projected to grow to about $155 billion by 2030, 2032, right? If you look at uh, the smart ports market, uh, it was about 1.8 to $2 billion, um, it's expected to reach more than $6 billion by 2728. Um, the airport's the same thing. It's growing from 7 billion to 10 billion by 2030. Smart cities, especially, were valued at about $1 trillion back in 2021. Uh, by 2030, they're expected to be beyond $10 trillion. Now, if you look at all of this, you know, we it feels that the gorilla's growth is substantial. If you look at our numbers, but it only indicates that we've only begun to tap the vast potential of these markets, right? There is more to capture going forward, and there's a burgeoning market in the coming years which we will be able to tap into. Okay, Jay, it's obviously a rapidly growing market, but you're going to have competitors. What makes you better? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think it is the value proposition and you know, what we offer to the customers today, right? Um, we're not just another tech company. Right. Our value proposition lies in convergence. We operate at the intersection of three high growth you know, sectors or industries, AI, cyber, uh, AI, cybersecurity, and smart infrastructure. 
Now, if you look at most companies, they kind of specialize in one area, right? And they're very good at it, but they specialize in one area. If you recollect what I've been kind of telling the market since 2020, July 2022, it's all about platform as a service. It's creating that one powerful ecosystem which allows us the unique ability to become the one throat to choke so that we're able to tackle the customer's problems head on as a single entity. Now, let's talk about the tangible benefits, right? The market we're talking about today is, you know, whether it's smart cities, AI, cybersecurity, and so on, they were trillions of dollars, they're growing at double digits and so on, but it is not about the market size, it's about the ability to convert these opportunities into recurring revenue streams. Now, for me, when I look at it, I look at beyond 25 and 26. I want to see where we are going to be by 2030. Can I be a you know a billion dollar revenue company? Absolutely, I can. Strategic alliances may help you get there. You've already got many great ones. Lanner, CS Energy. Talk about your strategic alliances. Sure. I mean, listen, strategic alliances, we don't do it for the sake of doing it. We're looking at it as a pillar of growth for us, right? They're a force multiplier in everything we do. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. For example, Leonard Electronics is, is, is a very prime example. Together with them, we're developing next generation security convergence solutions. What we're doing is we're marrying our AI software, driven software, with their hardware expertise. Now, the benefits are twofold. First, we can deploy the products faster which means we're able to um, accelerate our revenue realization much more quicker. Second, we're able to increase our profit margins. Why? Because we're able to utilize Lenner's manufacturing capabilities in a place like Thailand or Taiwan, for example, where we're able to reduce the cost significantly, enhancing our profit margins. And so the, the partnership is not just about you know, creating revenue, it's about efficiency, scale, and financial optimization. On the other hand, when we partner with someone like CS Energy, which you talked about, it's um, a, it's uh, CS Energy is a leader in what we call smart city and green city, right? Now with them, we're able to enhance our capabilities and then provide what we call a better outlay of services so that we can integrate our AI solutions into the customer's requirements, right? Now, these projects are not just short-term wins, they provide us what we call a foundation. Now, if you look at everything we do, it's all about foundation. What is the consistency I'm able to generate? What is the long-term financial performance? As you know, from next year onwards, we're doing a quarterly reporting. I wanna be able to stand in front of that market and address to them what are the tangible benefits I bring to the table or my, my partner should bring to the table. Thanks, Jay. We now have some financially oriented questions. And for those, we'd like to turn to the CFO of Gorilla, Bruce Bauer. Hello, we now have Bruce Bauer, the interim CFO of Gorilla. Bruce, great to have you. My pleasure, thank you. Now, Bruce, with over $40 million in cash, how is Gorilla prioritizing the deployment of these funds to maximize shareholder returns? Yes, so, so the up to the minute calculation is we have about $38 million in cash. So um, first of all, I'll, I'll, there's a breakdown. So 22 million of that is unrestricted cash. 16 million of that is restricted cash. So the first thing to do is for, for us is to make sure that we're moving the restricted cash into the unrestricted cash. So um, 8 million of the 16 million restricted cash is uh, tied up with um, as a guarantee for our project in the Middle East. That uh, all of that 8 million will be released into un unrestricted cash by March of next year. So what we're doing is really you know, delivering uh, on the milestones, billing the customer. Once the customer is built, then that cash gets released. Second thing is we have about 8 million that is tied up in um, restricted cash that is pledged against a loan we've taken. So what we're doing is trying to either pay back the loan, refinance it, or to sell the property that is the security for that. Um, so that basically, if we were to pay back the loan, it's 21 million, then what that would do is release the 8 million of cash. So net net, it's, it's not as big of an impact on us. So that is, um, you know, to give you an idea of how we're trying to liberate, you know, the, the restricted cash that's sitting there. In terms of how we're deploying it for the, the business overall, 
the first is that um, as you, you know, the question sort of implies that we had 40 million of cash. We had 40 million of cash earlier and we invested about 10 million into uh, our main project. That was to meet some of the obligations with the contract. That is for software and hardware orders. Um, we're billing that before the end of the year and then that will get recycled back into cash and you know we'll earn a margin on that so that's one way that we're deploying it the second is we have that uh, uh available for deploying into new projects so typically when we have a project we have to put up a guarantee five to fifteen percent of the contract value is the is the guarantee that we put up so we're saving this cash to deploy in guarantees and then also when we start a contract typically there's a period where we are working and we're incurring cost. Uh, we're recognizing revenue, but we're not billing. So it would usually be, you know, a few months of working before we can bill. And then, you know, there's an invoice and we get paid. So um, by having more ca uh, higher cash balance, we can deploy that and take on more contracts and grow the business. The last thing we're doing is uh, we are evaluating several um, bolt-on M&A transactions you know they're they're not large numbers in the grand scheme of things but they would help the business significantly to grow by adding a, a new product suite or a new customer base um, so we're looking at those right now your gross margin and operating profit improvements have been impressive bruce how confident are you in maintaining or even improving these margins as you scale yes yeah, so so there the two components here are the gross margin and the operating margin um for the gross margin, what we've tried to do is, is to be disciplined on the projects that we take in the future. So the first is that we have a cutoff of 40% gross margins on all of the new projects. Um, in addition, we're trying to you know, make it standard margin 45 or even 50% on new projects. There are a few ways we're doing that. Um, one is that we're trying to shift the mix. You know, So Jay would have talked about this. We're shifting the mix towards more um, uh, software, more integrated hardware, called a device where, where it's our hardware plus uh, software, you know, Gorilla software. So the margins are higher on those and also shifting towards recurring uh, longer term service type contracts. Um, all of those efforts in changing the mix boost the margins over time. The other thing we're trying to do is uh, we've reevaluated the costing that we have on our side so that basically we we are getting you know 40 percent 45 50 percent on on our new costings so that we're basically keeping our costings in line with inflation and thus the margins are are protected against inflation um another thing that we've done in terms of the the overall business is We've made some significant hires this year. So we have a COO, we have some some hires on the tech team, uh, CFO on the HR team. And we think that this will enable us to scale the business to twice the size. So in the future, um, as, the op, as the gross profit of the business grows, we should have the same SG&A costs. So that give, should give us operating leverage. So you know the, the business can realize higher um, operating margin. The last thing is we've undertaken a, uh, a legal and operational restructuring. Um, so over the next six months, we'll be optimizing for transfer pricing and and for um, intellectual property. You know, so positioning it the right in the right jurisdictions, signing the right transfer pricing agreements. So that should help us to save on operating and on net margin as well. Um, so so all of these measures together should mean that we'll get to an EBITDA margin above 20% next year, hopefully to 25%. Um, and then we'll be able to, to realize a net margin that is high teens. Turning finally now, Bruce, to that buyback program, the $6 million share buyback program. Gorilla made it clear that it believes that the stock is undervalued. And how do you balance those buybacks with investments in growth and innovation? Yes, so we, um, we are fortunate, as, as the answer to another question illustrated, to be cash rich at the moment. Um, you know, we were paid and we had guarantees released from our main project uh, and then th the other projects are generating cash as well. So we feel that we can invest comfortably into R&D. Uh, we, we've successfully launched a product, uh, a landmark product recently, the Gorilla Network Director. So um, we're able to keep investing in R&D at the moment um, by keeping some cash 
on on hold. As we mentioned, uh, that will be enable us to take on new projects and to grow the business. We also have invested heavily in terms of marketing and a sales team. Uh, those hires, those heads are already in place. So that helps us to find new projects and, and to grow the business that way. So with the cash that was sort of left over from all of those, we, we thought that there was a room for, of about 6 million to launch a buyback. We've completed 3.8 million of that and, and we'll be in the market in the future for the remainder of that. Um, but the we felt two things. One is that the, the share price was unfairly un, undervalued, right? Um, you know, we, we'd seen evidence of market manipulation. We also had seen uh, the stock price get annihilated really um, as we had issued equity earlier in the year. So we wanted to send a very firm message to the market that first of all, to fund new projects and to fund the business, we were not going to issue equity. And, and the way that we showed it is by buying shares instead of selling them. Um, the second thing is that, you know, for the future of the business, uh, if we wanted to do M&A using shares, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's important to have a share price that's fairly valued. So we want to reassure the market that we're you know, looking after shareholders, we're buying back shares when we think that they're too cheap. Um, and at the same time, like you said, we're balancing that with investments in growth to, to grow the business and, and to improve the product suite. Bruce, thank you for illuminating some of the financial aspects of Gorilla. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that, Bruce. Now, let's turn again to Jay, the CEO. Now, Jay, what is the essential value proposition? Why should investors take an interest in Gorilla right now? Good question. Why invest today? Why in Gorilla, right? Because Gorilla is at a crucial inflection point. We've built a strong foundation. Right? We're not just about keep, we're not just the ones who keep talking all the time saying we're doing great things. We're proving to our customers and we're expanding globally. We're not a one trick pony, right? Our technology is proven. Our partnerships are robust. Our market penetration and our expansion is pretty solid and rapid, which is important. But the real opportunity lies ahead. Why? Because we are aggressively expanding into regions, which like I guess talked about are investing very heavily. Think about Southeast Asia, Middle East, Latin America, the United States. The upside potential is enormous for us. So investors who actually come on board, we'll be helping them position themselves for an exponential return, hopefully, as we capture you know, an even larger market share as we go forward. Now, in short, I, I would, I would want to say that if, you're, if an investor is looking to invest in our company, we are actually shaping the future. We're delivering growth. And truly, Gorilla is the one to watch. Shaping the future, delivering growth. I like that a lot, Jay. Thanks. Thank you.